All right, I think Brooks, let's go ahead and uh, at least go through some of the introductory stuff here and uh, while other people join us. All right, well, thanks, Mike. Thank you guys all for joining yet another uh, gathering. We really appreciate y'all's um, taking out y'all time to just join us today. Uh, we have a very special treat as always, as usual. So um, without further ado, Let's get started. I don't know. Yeah, so we have our special guest um, who's going to be uh, Maida Owens, who's a part of the BCC fam, and she's going to be talking about putting Louisiana in the national context. So we're very excited to have Maida um, give a nice presentation. And of course, we couldn't do any of this without our partners. We want to thank everybody who you guys see right here on this slide, as well as the next slide our funders thank you all for just being able to help um help us along this journey and making this uh bcc fam an actual reality for everybody and so now we're going to get started on our spotlight our artists for this month for this gathering is dale periotti um, Dale does Blusiage, which of course I didn't really know too much about, but um, looking further into it, uh, this is like a centuries old technique, um, which is very popular in the 18th century French colonial settlement homes in which, you know, they basically did a lot of architecture with um, using uh, natural things such as grass and such. And uh, I think that Dale definitely represents more of the traditional house building um an area but now it's not necessarily uh done he doesn't really do this for architecture's uh, sake but just more so for art's sake uh dale fun fact is also a uh, actor so that's kind of fun as well and made it just put uh a uh, linkedin link if you guys are actually interested in dale and just finding out more information about him in the chat all right, so today's content, like I mentioned before, we have a lady of the hour and that's Maida Owens. And then we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna do Hope for the Coast and then we're gonna go into the deep question. I'm pretty sure you guys saw the invite, um, a link that will show you guys the BCC position statement. And we wanna kind of have a deep question slash breakout session discussing that. Um, so we definitely want you guys input and nothing has to be signed, um, sealed and delivered today, but as always, we definitely wanna see how many of you guys are really interested in this uh, collaboration, um, collaborational effort. And then last but not least, we'll have announcements and informal discussion until closing. Okay. okay. Brooks, uh, or uh, I just wanted to reiterate to anybody who's who's just joining us and who may not have been here before, if you can please uh, post your name in the chat and a, and a little bit about uh, who you are. Uh, we sure appreciate it. And uh, well, uh, Brooks, thanks for that little for for your introduction. And and uh, I may have taken that from you too quickly, but. Uh, uh, we're going to have Maida Owens, who not only is an, on our uh, Bayou Culture Collaborative Management team and who has done uh, a lot of work on the position statement, uh, primary author on the position statement we're going to discuss later, uh, and is with the Louisiana Folk Life Program. And she is going to talk to you, as she'll note, uh, about a couple of things, but really how is, is putting this uh, the circumstances we're now facing in in Louisiana into uh, the national into a national context. So with that, I'd sure like to welcome Maida. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm happy to share with y'all uh, a portion of uh, a workshop that I've been doing, um, both in the state and nationally. Um, about uh, the, the, to explain what's going on and also how to welcome newcomers to, uh, to your community. Um, 
so this is going to be two parts. The first part is uh, the research about mainly about sea level rise and the impact that it is going to have nationally. Uh, you know, Louisiana is definitely on the forefront of uh, a lot of changes, but um, um, a lot of other communities are around the country are either facing it now um, or will be facing it, it soon. Um, a little bit about uh, my perspective. Uh, I, you know, I'm from Baton Rouge. I've experienced all the hurricanes like everybody else, uh, and but from a little bit of a distance. So I never really focused on this that much until the 2016 flood when I first thought I might have to evacuate and even considered whether or not to relocate. And I decided not to relocate. Um, and so I got really intrigued with the idea of what happens to our cultures with so much migration and started learning about what's predicted in the future, you know, in, in the next, especially in the next 10 years. So the second question is uh, that drives me is what will our great grandchildren wish we had done? So whereas a lot of people are very focused on immediate disaster recovery, I tend to always be thinking about 10 years in the future so y'all can help understand exactly where I'm coming from. And I assure you, I respect everyone's decision whether to stay or move or whatever, that's a personal decision. And I'm, I certainly don't judge anyone uh, about their decision because I decided to stay, uh, even though I, I don't think people realize how much Baton Rouge was affected by some of these storms too, um, a week without electricity and such. Um, but the one of the major resources is the New York Times and ProPublica Climate Environment Series. Um, that. This, um, they have some incredible articles that are, some of them are interactive maps and such, but they also publish uh, reports from other news agencies. So uh, this is a really good uh, uh, hub for this information. Um, and they open it free. They feel like it's, it's so important that they don't have the paywall for certain parts of it. And this is where I found some of these uh, statistics uh, that just to help you understand that we are not alone by any means. In summer 2021, one in three Americans experienced an extreme weather event. And then regarding movement, moving, one in 12 Americans in the Southern half of the country will move towards California the Mountain West or the Northwest over the next 45 years because of climate influences alone. Another researcher put it this way, that in when you take into consideration all the people uh, from the, the Dust Bowl who moved West and all the African-Americans that moved North in the Great Migration, um, what's going to happen in, in, the, in the coming years is going to be twice that num that total number in half the time. So this is going to this is going to affect the entire country. Now, what's going to happen in the next ten years? Um, I'm sure everyone on this uh, call is very familiar with the environmental changes that are going to be happening. We talk a lot about sea level rise here, and that's what most of uh, the resources that I'm going to share with you concern. But remember that there's drought, wildfires, extreme heat, extreme precipitation and flooding, stronger storms, tornadoes, and thawing uh, permafrost. Now, sea level rise has by far gotten the most uh, interest from researchers, but there are some, uh, I'm going to share one source about wildfires. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of economic changes that are going to be happening. There's going to be major changes in the workforce. And a lot of this is, is a shift away from fossil fuels, but also remote work. I'm not going to talk much about the economic changes, but just know that that's also going to be happening in the next 10 years, too. This is the wildfire um, resource. The New York Times has this uh, wildfire risk map. 
Um, and thank goodness this is one thing that Louisiana has minimal uh, concern with. Now about sea level rise, um, this is a map that shows all the counties on all the coast, uh, well, on the three coasts, uh, some people consider the Great Lakes a coast too, but the blue counties all, all will lose land to the ocean. So whereas Louisiana is definitely one of the most dramatic uh, cases, um, there's a lot of people going to be uh, impacted by this. Now note the red counties will in will have uh, become receiving communities. So they're going to have uh, people moving into their communities. And the darker the red, the more people that will be, move into it. Now, where do they get, where, how do they figure all this out? Um, one of the major research, researchers is Matthew Hauer at Florida State University. He's a sociologist. And he uses big data to figure this out. Specifically, he uses uh, tax return address changes. So they, so he's predicting who is going to move where. Um, to and this is actually a fascinating. Um, if you have a small monitor, you're, it's, you're not going to be able to see it very well. So uh, in the, I'm going to put in the link in the chat all the links to all of these resources too. Um, this is Florida. All of this is population movement in, in Florida. And this is, these are the people who are going to move within Florida. All of these people are going to move elsewhere. So, um, so Florida, Texas, New York, and California are the top four. And considering their population size, that's not surprising. But look who's fifth. Louisiana with significantly less population has this much displacement though. So again, most Louisiana people are going to move within Louisiana, but and the, of those who are leaving the state, most will go to Texas which is following a historic pattern. We even have Cajun Creole songs about going to Texas. So that, that's nothing new, that will just continue. Now, Matthew Hauer also graphed out the net change in population due to sea level rise. And again, Florida is number one, but look who's number two with significantly less population than all these other states, we're number two. Now, this is a map of coastal counties that have above national average percent of African Americans. And this is from the work of uh, Hardy Dean and several other authors. And they will be, um, he shows how the coast, the movement away from coast are disproportionately going to affect African Americans. And he argues that they, if um, most planning nowadays is, cons they consider it colorblind. And he says that that really is not appropriate since so many African Americans are going to be disproportionately affected by this. And that, so you really can't take a, uh, a colorblind approach to planning. Again, all these links are gonna be in, in the chat after I finish. Now this is about Louisiana, but um, I really wanted to include it because it's so important. If you're not familiar with Shirley Laska's work, she edited this volume on Louisiana's response to extreme weather just in 2020. So it's very current information and uh, very important. And this is a Google book. This is, this is complete, this is a Google doc that's completely online. You can buy it in print if you wish. So now we're gonna move to resources uh, for communities. Uh, most of it is, it is about uh, climate migration or could be used for climate migration, but I'm drawing from immigration research, arts and culture research and climate research. 
The first one is Art Place America. Um, they did a series of field scans. And uh, this one is Bridging Divides, Creating Community. Now it is, it is specifically for uh, immigration and it shows how arts and culture can provide strategies for coping with uh, newcomers uh, getting to know the, the long-term residents. But all of this applies to climate migration equally. And so in my longer workshop, I go into more detail about exactly what that means. Just to give you an idea is one of the important points they say is to elevate cultural traditions as assets and to focus on traditions that are widely shared and can be more easily accepted. So rather than do Cajun fiddling, for example, which you have to know how to play the fiddle before you can, you can uh, do that, um, because these are, these are supposed to be participatory projects uh, where people are actu actually doing it. So foodways, uh, TEK, traditional uh, ecological knowledge, all the fiber work and storytelling are highly recommended for this type of project. And they're done through what's called an artist community engagement project um, where um, it's not just getting an artist to paint a mural, it's the process of how they decide it with the community. The community helps create it, design it, and, and actually paint it. So community gardens, story, story circles, and uh, then community quilts is often. This is the Rougarou quilt, and um, quilters prepared a tent at the Rougarou Fest where the people attending could help make the quilt. And so then afterwards, the quilters fin finished it. Um, uh, this is a resource coming out of the world of folklore. Two folklorists um, wrote The Art of Community. Uh, they were heavily involved in working with social services agencies to serve immigrants that had come to a community. So they were very much uh, talking about newcomers. I recommend this because it has several excellent um, profiles of communities and projects uh, to give you a real good hands-on um, uh, uh, understanding of what can be done. Welcoming, uh, Welcoming America is a national organization that um, is focused on immigrants, but again, it, the strategies frequently apply just as much to climate migrants. And they have a social cohesion series that's very, that's very good. This is one of the articles. Um, but one of, their, one of their programs is called Certified Welcoming. And in some of our working groups, we've talked about whether or not receiving communities could be certified to be ready to be a, uh, a uh, receiving community. And so this is one of the types of certification programs that could be used as a model. Some of their standards relate more directly to immigrants like uh, English proficiency, but uh, standard four is connecting communities and that directly relates to, uh, you know, uh, could, could easily be applied to climate migrants too. And then the last resource and is the most recent, just this year, the National League of Cities published what cities should know about climate change and populations on the move. They um, have three categories of uh, cities, the vulnerable, receiving, and destination cities. So, uh, you know, some communities are both vulnerable and receiving communities, um, but they also have profiles of seven different um, cities around the country who are coping with this in different ways. So it, it is really a strong one. Oh, and one more. Uh, last is from climate research. The Climate Migration Network is a national network of people uh, wanting to put people first. So there's a lot of affinity with the Bayou Culture Collaborative. They published Lead with Listening, a guidebook for community conversations on climate migration. And it is excellent. Uh, and again, it's just a PDF online that you can download. 
but uh, they really want to you know, respect the community members as experts of their own lived experience, to listen first, earn trust, build relationships. And very importantly, they have exercises in, the, the, um, in this uh, publication to use with groups. So it's, it's quite good. So that's all I have. Um, I will be posting all the links into uh, the um, uh, uh, chat. Uh, it wouldn't let me post so many links at one time. I was planning to have those uh, in the chat while, while I was talking, but that didn't happen. So um, if y'all know of other resources that I should be aware of, or all of us should be aware of, uh, please let me know. I'm interested in, uh, this is uh, definitely a topic where you just continue learning. Um, and so um, that's it. Thank you. Oh, Thanks, and if anybody Rick. wants to uh, have one of my workshops, um, I'd be glad to talk to y'all about doing that. And I'm a state employee, so it's free. <laughs> there is no charge. <laughs> uh, thanks, Maida. And uh, I just realized, you know, as I know everybody faces some time constraints and, and may come in a little bit later, um, some of those uh, uh, returning to our, our gatherings may have been a little more accustomed to a poll question and, and some other things before we started with the, the featured speaker. And uh, I just realized, you know, that that some of you may have come in as Meta started or after Meta started, and uh, I think we have a couple of extra minutes. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the uh, well uh, about the 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 different format we're going to be we're using this this month. But I think we have a minute or two if anybody was a little bit behind on on. Uh, on what Maida was talking about, if somebody'd like to ask a question briefly of Maida, although she will be posting all of those resources as she noted. So, uh, and as well, of course, our, our recordings of the, the gatherings are always available as quickly as possible within the week or so after the, the gathering. And other than that though, let's see if anybody, uh, well, Meta will be posting all those resources, fantastic stuff in those maps. I've always been impressed with. Um, but as usual, despite the fact that we address some somewhat depressing subjects, uh, we do like to to really, you know, kind of express a little hope. And and what we like to do is ask our speaker, you know, what is your hope for the coast, especially given, you know, the the, the subject matter uh, we're addressing. So Maida, tell us something hopeful about that you find hopeful. Well, um, my hope for the coast is that whether people decide to stay or move, that they are able to stay connected with their communities and their culture, um, that whether or not it becomes a, um, a network, a virtual network, or you're still next door to your, uh, to, you know, you're still living in your community. I just hope in with all the disruption that is predicted to come, that uh, what makes Louisiana um, so special is our people and our culture, uh, cultures, and that I hope that they survive the, um, the disruption that is predicted. Thank you, Maida. Um, that again, the resources you you you've collected and, and those maps are all uh, informative and impressive. And, and those links are in the chat. I also see some other people have have added some links, and a couple of people have uh, raised their hand and asked for the opportunity to ask a question or or mention something, something. So, uh, Gary Lafleur, Doctor Lafleur, thanks, Maida. Uh, Thanks for your presentation. What occurs to me is I remember uh, before anyone sort of in state politics was talking about um, coastal land loss. And then I remember the years when that became part of people's platforms, what we're gonna do with coastal land loss. And I feel like we're a little ahead of the curve because we're 
what we're talking about, community movements. So what would you say about, you know, how far ahead is the state government on really thinking about this? Because I think uh, I have the feeling they're, they're catching up. It's, it's kind of a new, it's still a new problem, I think, for political folks to think about. Well, um, if y'all have taken a close look at uh, LA Safe, um, the entire, there's a whole section that the, the Department of Culture, Recreation and Tourism would be um, instrumental in, in, in uh, the planning. But practically all of it was about 20 years in the future that, you know, we didn't need to worry about that right now. Uh, and so there was no timeline and no budget for all of those uh, strategies and, and goals. Um, but I am seeing more interest now. Uh, I think the people are starting to realize that the human dimension, which is so much more than simply culture and, and uh, you know, it's mental health, it's land use, it's developers, it's, it, you know, it, it, human dimension is definitely broader. But you know, my hope is that state government starts to um, starts to address the, the people issues too, and not just the physical coast. The physical coast is very important, very important. Um, but so are the people. Thanks. Thanks, Gary and Maida. I believe somebody else raised their hand. If. Yes. Hi, Joy. Nice to, Hi. Nice to join <laughs> us. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to see you again. Um, I had a, a question as far as, um, so I'm in St. John the Baptist Parish on the West Bank in a um, little town called Wallace. Um, we are certainly, we've had our fair share of weather events. Ida hit us pretty hard. But with that being said, um, our elevation is higher than the East Bank of St. John Parish. And I think with um, some more informed construction techniques, you know, that is that um, harkens back to the type of construction that was used, you know, throughout the 18th century, that we could build houses, you know, that would be more, um, that could stand up to these to major storms. But with that being said, I was wondering if you had um, particular resources for communities that would like to attract um, people that are forced to leave um, to their community, um, because for my town of Wallace and the West Bank of St. John Parish, what is being used against us um, is that our population density is not as high. And so I think this is being used as a strategy for industrialization. Um, but I feel like we could, I would like to get more communities um, that, that look and consider our area as a potential home for them um, and, and I love the strategies of being able to use, you know, um, being a welcoming community, using um, folklore, storytelling, all as a way of making our community stronger with people rather than, you know, chemical processes. So I was just wondering if you knew like specific um, resources that would be helpful for that. Well, actually, some of the resources I just mentioned, uh, I would definitely uh, want you to look at, at some of those um, that conversation nationally has hardly gotten started. Mm -hmm. uh, two years ago at uh, the Earth Institute Summit, it was all about the vulnerable communities and a uh, very little conversation about the receiving communities. But then the next couple of years, there started to be more and more about receiving communities. So we're really, participating in something, a dialogue that's just now getting started. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there are definitely cultural strategies, um, both just for the local community and as a state that we, we can consider. Um, but I can't point you right now to this is, this is the one. The, the ones that I posted in there uh, uh, under resources definitely take a look at those because a lot of them have excellent case studies mm -hmm. and that's why I included them. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Joy. Um, I believe we had one more, Richie. Oh, Mike, I wanted, I wanted to say one more thing about going back to uh, older uh, architectural uh, um, ways to cope with flooding. Did y'all know that around 1900, you could order a house from Sears and Roebuck? 
and northwest northeast Louisiana has a lot of them or had a lot of them I don't know if they're still there but they came planning to flood that they had plugs in the in the floor mm -hmm. that so that when the house when the house flooded the water could get out without destroying the, the, the house not just taking the house apart so they had plugs in the floor so that the water could get out of a flooded house because it was going to flood now sheetrock there's no answer about you just can't do flooding and sheetrock <laughs> okay i'm sorry who's next uh, real quick, if uh, Richie, blink. Uh... Hi, I have a question about um, the potential of uh, markets developing around coastal resiliency um, bonds or coastal, uh, some sort of trading mechanism that could happen around that sort of thing. Um, I've, I've noticed some people um, asking about that coming down to Southern Black Conspiracy Research that um, it seems that they're often wall street types right what are some of the opportunities and pitfalls of something like that being developed well richie you are mentioning something i'm not at all familiar with so <laughs> <laughs> i'm afraid i can't answer that but i definitely want to learn more about it um, um again this is a good reason to make a plug everybody participate in the working groups because there are some fascinating dialogues and this is where you know I have a feeling that the culture and policy working group would love to discuss that with you, but personally, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, I, I uh, am. Oh, go ahead. I just say I have a, a whole lot of questions about it. it seems um, it's not quite in its, in its infancy, but there could be some promising things. But um, I, I think there's some pitfalls there too. But I'd love to know more. And Richie, you can email me. Um, at Saunders BCC, BCC at Gmail, and I can definitely uh, put you in touch with some of the people within our, our collaborative that are working working specifically, uh, more specifically with those issues. And I uh, sure appreciate you being here and, and uh, kind of envious of your background, of your uh, location there. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got some folks that are doing some uh, research on Oyster Reef right now. I was able to step away for the call. <laughs> so, all right, well, look, thank you again. All right, everybody, thanks. Um, we are going to, as I, as I noted, uh, today's, and, and I want to give us time to do that, so let's go ahead and move right into it. Today's uh, 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 gathering, we're going to really focus on some of the you know, we have these focus groups, these working groups, and people are really putting some time and work into them. So uh, what, we've, what we've really come up with as a, as a collaborative is that we need a, you know, a, a if brief position statement about uh, you know, the, the BCC, what we represent. And uh, so I hope that many of you saw in the invite that we had a link to the draft of the position statement right now. So we'd really like uh, a lot of you to, to, to step out into a, a breakout room and go over what we have. And this is not something we're asking people to sign on to. We want to polish this up, get a final draft, and then you know we can distribute it out for, to both organizations and individuals and uh, see if people might be interested in signing on and, and ex expanding this network and this collaborative. So with that, uh, I think there you see there are some things to think about in the breakout room. And uh, we, I, I would like to ask that in those breakout rooms, maybe you could ask one or you could uh, come up with one of you within the room that might like to briefly discuss anything that y'all talked about. So when you head out into your rooms, if you could kind of nominate somebody to do that afterwards. We're going to give us a, give everyone a little bit longer on this one and in about 15 minutes, we're going to bring everybody back and we appreciate your feedback and, and look forward to hearing. It. Well, I hope that was productive. I, I, I hope everybody's now able to come back and join us and get out of the rooms. Um, you know, again, I just want to kind of reiterate that this is Meta and, and others have put an awful lot of work into this and just tried to, you know, kind of, come up with something succinct that, that kind of clarifies our position. So let's jump right into this and, uh, and ask that uh, 
I think Miss Kathleen, uh, if you'd like to mention a little bit about uh, what y'all spoke uh, about in your group. And, well, we, uh, um, we read over the, the statement and we discussed in um, the three of us that were, you know, in it discussed. And one of the things, um, the statement is, is a good generic statement. You know, we think it's a good generic statement, but I think we discussed because I'm home Indian and our communities are very, you know, been, are very seriously impacted by sea rise and the other issues, climate change. And I discussed because indigenous peoples, tribal people have a different way of looking at, should have a different way of looking at this because we deal with, uh, even though we're not a fairly recognized tribe, we're state recognized, but tribal people, we are be trying to become fairly recognized and tribal people to continue their identity really need to be, if they have to move, they have to move as a community. They should not be moving, uh, taking a check from somebody, either the federal government or the state saying, let me give you a check, go buy your house somewhere. That's not in a floodplain. You know, um, because we have so many things that if we all disperse all over the place, then we will no longer be home Indians. We will be with the rest of the folks. And so that was one of the main discussions we had. And Mr. Flint came in and, you know, he, he put some good comments in too. He said that uh, he was staying, you know, whether he would never not move. And um, I think we have a lot of people that's going to think that way, going to try to figure out how to mitigate staying where they are some kind of way. You know, but um, his comment said there's a lot of things in communities that need to be uh, washed away when the sea rises <laughs> and that needs to change. And I kind of agree with him on that. But, you know, the communities are going to have to figure that out themselves, I think. So that's kind of what we discussed in a nutshell. Did I miss something, Gary? Got the thumbs up from Gary. Um, yeah. And I, and I do also want to uh, mention that the Meta has shared this document, so you can people can um, comment on it as as we it's a work in progress. And uh, thank you, Miss Kathleen. I I see that Jonathan uh, Foray has has his hand raised to maybe Everyone. talk a little bit. Yeah. So our group uh, we didn't make it fast past the first paragraph. And we got stuck on that and went over it and over it and really had a, a good conversation. And part of that was um, surrounding the last sentence of that first paragraph about our people, cultures and communities, both vulnerable and receiving communities are left to figure it out and fend for themselves. Now, I like that because I'm done with being polite about the issue. And I feel like we need to be, um, uh, it's not aggressive, but not mincing words, I believe was uh, Robin had said in our group. Um, and so, uh, but in that same, uh, in that same thought, we want to be taken seriously. And so we want to um, be seen as not, um, I guess the conversation was around like not we want to we want to seem more you know this is a professional group with using professional language versus um you know left to figure it out and fend for themselves i think was the even though that's the truth so um i think maybe just finding a balance between um the not being polite anymore while being professional is where we need to figure out what that sounds like. And not that we have the answer to that, but that's just where we got stuck in our conversation. Uh, and uh, thanks, Jonathan. And again, hopefully everybody will really uh, uh, comment on the on the shared document with some of these that extremely important point that <laughs> that fine line between not being polite anymore and, and being professional. Uh, 
Maida and Ms. Hanora, um, either one of you would like to to uh, yeah. I'll nominate you first, Maida. Okay. Um, yeah, my group uh, asked that I report back, and it was a really good discussion. We started with some very uh, um, specific things to add, like make explicit um, using traditional knowledge about the building trades uh, to and more focus on adaptation strategies. Um, but then they said also that it's too long that uh it's too much to digest um it's some of it seemed carefully worded but not sure what the point was um which uh, i i think is really important we definitely need to address that uh they wanted more resources for culture bearers to remain in their communities uh, but in the broad scope of it is um, a better state, a, a more clearer statement about why it is important to the state. And um, mm -hmm. how does the how does this help uh, quality of life. But then they, they did say that there were no barriers that they wouldn't they would sign on, uh, but it could be improved. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Maida. And um, again, <laughs> getting some great uh, feedback here. Uh, Ms. Honora? Uh, yeah, let me lower my hand here. Okay. Uh, yeah, my, I was in group seven and uh, there were three other people in my group in, in from a diverse uh, background and nobody's had any major uh, concerns about the statement um, or major additions but like uh, was previously said about being you know not uh, balancing being polite but with being professional and not being afraid to say something that we should say one of the participants in my group mentioned that uh we shouldn't shy away from the issue of oil and gas industry impacts causing a lot of our problems and the Corps of Engineers and you know decisions that have been made. We don't want to be seen as having a political agenda and ha having a neutrality, but yet we can't ignore the elephant in the room. Uh, uh, also, that was uh, said. It was really nice to see that. Uh, the, some of the things that have already been done uh, as far as focus on preservation, promoting culture, some of the resources we're providing. One of the folks mentioned really appreciated uh, getting teaching resources at a, a fair she recently went to and things on mental health. Uh, Dick, she'll appreciate that. The issue of mental health did come up. Um, and then also that uh, traditional culture is not just something to save, but it can be used to foster the community resilience and the interconnection between everything. But nobody in my group found any major uh, issues uh, that would keep them from signing on or any major things that were left out, but uh, all agreed that they, they were going to look at it a little more and give give Maida some more comments if they came up with anything. And also had a few that were really new to the collaborative that were just joining in and looking at joining some of the working groups, so that'll be good. Yeah, and especially the way uh, a couple of the groups are moving forward. And I, and I think also the, the, we're at a point with those working groups and some of us have met in kind of an inner group uh, type session, but it's, it's really to a point where I'm gonna start working to merge some of those, uh, some of those groups and kind of get the, the even larger collaboration between those groups and, and all of the people who are really putting time into into this. I, uh, if anyone else uh, would like to report out on what their, their group spoke about, uh, you can raise your hand now. Or well, otherwise, I, would, we... but I can't, I can't raise my hand. I don't know why. Okay. All right, Shauna. Can I just jump in? Uh, I don't remember our group name but it was me and Susan Roach and uh, Sarah Franzen, who's a new member of our group. We should welcome Sarah to our group. Uh, and, and Brittany, uh, who's been in our group and is in, I think, one of the working groups. So we had a good discussion. And um, 
I thought Susan made the same point that she thought Susan Roach made some of the same points that she thought the beginning of it particularly was, uh, I don't know, I don't want to put words in your mouth, Susan, but it was something like it is, too, is too dense, um, that the beginning needed uh, needed to be was too long, too dense. Um, and uh, she said that it, it limited the audience, she felt like. Um, and then, um, both Sarah and Brittany made some points about inclusivity, and I think Brittany may have put some wording, some suggested wording in, and um, Sarah pointed out that, that this document seemed to be power neutral and that did not seem to recognize power differences among groups and that she wasn't exactly sure what that wording would be, but that um, uh, that, that we are not only dealing with a vulnerable physical coast, but they're also vulnerable communities in different ways. And that that doesn't seem to be in there. That was the only thing. That, she didn't note that as a barrier. She, again, everybody said, yeah, we could sign on to this. It might could be tweaked a little bit here or there. Um, um, Brittany pointed out that when she read Cultures of Louisiana, that she wasn't sure what that pointed to. And that um, she would appreciate something that was more along the lines of the multiple cultures of Louisiana or the diverse cultures of Louisiana. She said she knew it's adding a little word, but just something that would signal to people to send them a little signal that when we say cultures, that we're really thinking broadly and uh, inclusively. I hope I've captured that. Brittany, Sarah, y'all can jump in if it, if it didn't. I, I think that, but basically they said, this is a really good starting point. Thanks, Shauna. Um, and I noticed that David, Jeremy raised yeah. his hand, although I don't think it came across. So David, if you- Oh, I, I, raised, I raised my physical hand. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, well, we, we had uh, Brooks, Dix, and Teresa were in the group with us, and Brooks and Dix have gone for now, so I guess it's between me and Teresa. Uh, if she's still here, uh, I don't see her leave. Uh, no, we just we, we spent a lot of time discussing uh, uh, the document itself, not so much the wording, but um, Teresa talked a lot about uh, who is this document intended for? I mean, who is our target audience? You know, who, who are we trying to get a, a point across to the politician, general public? You know, whatever. And I said it might probably be a little bit of, of everything, but I think from hearing what other people talk about it being maybe a little too long, a little worried, I started to mention too about, yeah, I mean, whenever you have a position statement, anything more than, than a page, you, you've lost people. You know, I think maybe we, could, we can uh, get it down because we have to get the word across. As we were saying yesterday's, yesterday's meeting we had online is that uh, people, even Thibodeau uh, at the Thibodeau Rotary Club, didn't know what, what this was all about. You know, I mean, I mean my God, Thibodeau, you know. <laughs> Um, another point that we talked about and that I particularly like in the, in the, uh, in the uh, document itself is that when you go to the second page, middle second page, when we see, we see our beliefs, and I really enjoyed that the fact that our first belief is that we acknowledge that people are Louisiana's most valuable assets. It just has to be a humanistic uh, approach to it. We talk about culture, because like I said in, in, in our little meeting, you know, culture isn't something that just kind of appears out of the swamp like like a fifthly, you know, if this is this is us, these are flesh and blood people, you know, and we're talking about and we have to be able to provide the means for the people to continue producing the uh, the culture that we are, to put it bluntly, exploiting through tourism. But, and we talked about it yesterday, tourism itself, but I have nothing as tourism. I've made a lot of my living through tourism also, but I want to be able to present something that's uh, that's real and 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 uh, heartfelt about what it is. That's some kind of you know, as, as Barry Ancelé wrote in a poem years ago, six flags over the cages. You know, that, <laughs> I don't want it to be that at all. But unfortunately, sometimes he tends to be that. So the, the uh, tourism, kind of like the oil and gas industry, is, is extracted. And they're taking things out. We're not putting anything back in. And I think it's our role as as humanists, culture bearers, bearers of the culture bearers, um, to make sure that culture still continues to be produced. Uh, in new ways, not actually having to, you know, uh, still do the things we've done them for a hundred years, but still doing. Talking about bousillage, 
for example, Dale's, uh, and that he's a great actor too. He talked about that. He was, I just worked on a film that he was in and he did a great job. He, I think he out acted a professor last year and he was doing a scene with, but that's, that's neither here or there. Oh, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's the, this document we talked about has to reflect all of those values that we're trying to, to get across and the funding. Also, that's key. You know, we have all these great people on this in these groups, very knowledgeable, very impressive group. I'm honored to be a part of this group. But we also have to have the money. Anytime uh, any project I've ever worked on, if it, if it succeeds, it's because I had the right people and the and, the, and money. Maybe not. You know, we never had a lot of money, right? But you have to have some money to do this, right? And we also brought out the fact that um, you might have seen that yesterday that Senator Cassidy and Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island, I believe, just passed some, some a law bill that's saying that Louisiana and other coastal uh, states like Rhode Island will be getting billions of dollars you know, with a B, you know, whether they're going to see any of that money or not, but you know, they're saying this money is there. And so we're not asking for billions, you know, like for the culture part, we might take billions through the custom restoration part, but for what we're asking for, I don't think it's, it's uh, going to cost that much. Uh, Quite frankly, so that's not, that's not the only thing we talked about. Uh, and and uh, uh, excuse me, Dix talked a lot about what she does um, um, to art therapy and, and helping people, you know, uh, through the, go through the trauma, uh, live through the, uh, work through the trauma that they experienced because of Katrina and other disasters like that. So that was very interesting. So, but yeah, I mean, the document itself I think is great, but I think we need to to, to boil it down a little bit. Put it, back, put it like that, that uh, make it a bit more concise. Thanks, David. Uh, I, 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 I mean, I think this is going to be incredibly helpful. Right? This is a collaborative, so uh, yeah, we need to all have our, our input and feedback. Our, our, your feedback, everybody's feedback is incredibly valuable. Um, Although I see uh, Joy Banner has raised her hand real quick. If you if you have uh, something, some something Sorry. you'd like to mention. Sorry, our group didn't um, didn't um, respond yet. Um, so I just I, I'll be quick about um, most of the, the things that um, you all mentioned in in terms of the length. Um, it's a great document. Has a lot of information in it. Um, but it seems like there could you know some org organization maybe condensing the themes down to a couple of um, a couple of those of those key points. Um, we also talked about the well, and I mentioned there doesn't seem to be um, the intersection of, of their mention of being intersection of race and climate or the intersection of class and climate, you know, to this discussion. And I think um, when someone mentioned, you know, power neutral, um, I think that's what um, I, that's what I interpreted as, as being part of that issue. Um, also to just, the, and someone mentioned a, a previous speaker just said something about tourism and you're exactly right. Tourism can be extractive, um, but there is also a way to uplift tourism, um, as something that is economically sustainable. And it involves, you know, the inclusion of so many communities who would like their voice, who need their voice to be heard. Um, so, uh, leading more into the opportunities for tourism. And who should be representing that that tourism and that in that heritage? I think could be spoken to a bit. Um, and then anyone from my group, I don't think that I quite got everything. So if you need to jump in and supplement, please do. Okay, this is Connie, mm -hmm. and um, yes, definitely formatting issues. One page is a great idea. Being more direct, more um, vocabulary that is more active voice. Um, define who is BCC and LFS. So who are we, um, you know, why is this important? And I mean, kind of also illustrate too that we're, we're not naive. We understand that the value of this natural resource alone, much less the people is super important to the planet. And then of course the people on it. But, um, but we do have to address that we do have people living in these places that are disappearing what what do we do about it? And then um, even if it's even it's if it the only answer is to to relocate, which it will be in many cases, then um, how do we re recover these natural resources so that they can be productive? Um, not that might not be our issue as Bayou Culture Collaborative, but 
just to kind of let everybody know we're not just, you know, save the people, save the people without a deep understanding of the bigger picture here. Um, so that, that, I think that was it that we talked about. That's as far as we got to, by the way, that first paragraph. <laughs> so we need more time. Uh, thanks, Connie. Enjoy both uh, of you. And, and again, you know, I hope everybody can, can spend a little time commenting on it uh, in the shared document as well. Um, so, um, for no other raised hands, you know, I did want to note, I guess, our announcements. I did want to note that uh, uh, several of you brought up an issue that I think Colette Pichon Battle will be speaking about next uh, at the next gathering as far as equity issues and, and you know, that the power differentials that are or are not being addressed. Um, just to make that note before we go directly to that announcement. Hello, Shauna. Uh, the only thing I wanted to point out is that there is a question in the chat that might need to be addressed for just a minute. Um, and the question is, is there a goal for the completion date? Oh. And what's the what's the next process? Yeah, I saw that too. And I thanks for uh, bringing that back up because I wanted to kind of defer to Maida. Do you... I mean, I, I think our timeline is almost immediate, but. Um... Well, the, the, what, what I wanna do is get with some technical writers that are, have volunteered to help reorganize and um, um, basically produce draft two. Um, and then uh, we'll bring it back to people and ask them, uh, is this any better? Um, and at some point, you know, once the people who are actually actively involved um, um, have the input, and we kind of together we we have a draft, you know, a statement that we're comfortable with, then we'll be inviting. We'll post it on the website on the Louisiana Folklore um, Society website, and people will people and organizations, individuals and organizations will be able to sign on to it. Um, as a public statement that, you know, we're not alone in um, in feeling this way. That there there are there, a lot of people want to center the people and not just the physical coast. So, um, and then we'll reach out specifically to organizations and ask them whether you know if they haven't participated so far. Um, you know, asking them whether or not they would feel comfortable endorsing it. And I, I think the chat uh, mentioned before the holiday season, so we're uh, we are the timeline is well before that, uh, I believe. Uh, Sonora, yeah. yeah, I I just wanted to mention one other thing that a lot of folks may not realize. Sort of the reason, one of the reasons we wanted to have this statement in uh, Maida's conversations with the governor's office about different activities they might be doing. Uh, we, we also realized that we need to show that this is not just a handful of people that care about this. That that's one of the reasons we wanna have something that different groups can sign on to, because if you want the politicians and the funders to recognize that this is very important and that we're act, we have a lot of people that really care about this, that, that that's what we're trying to do here. So if we get something that we can get a lot of people to sign on to, it it shows, it helps elevate all of our voices and get attention and hopefully some funding. But just to be included in, in the decision-making process as active participants is a big goal. So just wanted to throw that in for people who aren't, because you always need to know when you talk about who your audience is, I guess we didn't yeah. make that quite clear. And that that's one of the main, reason we one of the main audiences that we wanted to have for this but maybe you can maybe speak a little more to that as well um i tend to want to speak to to the state bureau, uh, bureaucracy you know that uh, in addition to the funders so um i'll be real honest is that that is a lot of who i'm thinking of when i was drafting this uh, the, you know, I did the first draft, which is about three drafts ago. Um, but yeah, that's that's why we want 
input is to clarify all this. You know, it, it's, I, I completely agree with you, Honora. The, um, the, it's, we have more power the more we show that this isn't just a handful of people wishing for something. And uh, I mean, it's a, more than a handful of people who are willing to put quite a bit of time into it to start with. And uh, which is without a doubt well appreciated. Uh, I noted that uh, I noticed that Simone uh, posted in the chat. I I, uh, I believe on our next slide. Um, if if anybody does have some important announcements, um, you can post those in chat. But um, as I was mentioning, I sure hope everybody will join us for uh, Colette Pichon battle. She's a, a obviously a, a very um, influential voice and uh, we'll be addressing some of the, the very issues we uh, were brought up today. Uh, but I did notice Simone posted that the next uh, and the culture and coastal planning group, you know, has really kind of become a, an umbrella group for a lot of the other issues. So I, I would really encourage people to uh, join that meeting. I believe it's August 4th at 1 p.m. Um, Shauna, if we can. Oh, and again, I will, I will reiterate. Um, you can either go to louisianafolklore.org to get about, uh, to get more information. I think everybody that's here at this point uh, knows this, but as always, uh, please contact me directly if you have any any questions at saundersbcc at gmail.com. Um, 